Hello, Anne. How are you? Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. I'm doing well. Good. Uh, things are a little different. Uh, I, not on your end, because I see you are there, and those two white lumps on the couch are in place and, and uh, appropriately excited about another installment of Ask Eddie. And you never know, I'm, I'm in my kitchen tonight. Uh, because Kathleen has gone off to do a trade show and she normally takes over the kitchen table as her office, uh, but she is not here. So I get the kitchen table where the light is nice. And so I'm, that's where I'm ensconced tonight. So, <laughs> and, nice and we may, change. pardon me? It's nice to have a change. It is. It is. And uh, and we may we may get a visitation if we get one, we'll get a visitation right there from Tizzy. That's that's her little area back there. So she may just it, some, you know, it's also we're recording this close to her dinner time. So we may we may hear some squeals from Tizzy. OK. <sighs> shall we uh, shall we get rolling? Let's get rolling. OK. Hi. You want me to go first or you want to go first? You, you go first. You go first. And this one is from Harriet. <clears throat> I was intrigued by High Tide, which I had never seen before. It's too bad that handsome Don Castle did not become a big star. I followed Eddie's introduction about the, about the portion of High Tide in which script pages seem to be missing. I could not detect this point in the film. Please point out where, when that segment happened. You said it would be easy to notice. That is too high of a bar for me. Also, who was Don Castle slave really in love with? The nice young secretary or the murdered newspaper owner's wife? That was another mystery. <laughs> well, that that's for you to decide either way you want it. I, I think cl clearly, uh, I mean, if you go by surface intentions, he was uh, trying to get away from um, Julie Bishop, who played the wife, and he was definitely interested in Annabelle Shaw who was the secretary. And this is all in reference to my recent screening of uh, High Tide on, on Noir Alley. I think we're failing, Anne, in my efforts, and now I'm failing in my efforts to keep this light in a reasonable thing. It's <laughs> gonna be a mess in a minute. Um, our efforts to kind of keep Noir Alley stuff off the Ask Eddie segments is proving fruitless, and so many people wanna follow up the broadcasts with questions about the movies. Anyway, um, the the missing scene, um, it, it wasn't a missing scene. It was a scene that they elected to start in the middle, which is, uh, and if you haven't seen High Tide, if you're watching this and you haven't seen High Tide, uh, stop listening because I'm going to give away a big spoiler. It's um, the scene where Don Castle, well, I won't say whose body he discovers, but he comes in and uh, discovers a, a body and, and stashes the body in the closet and then leaves. In the original screenplay, you actually saw, there were two pages of script that preceded that, where you saw how that character ended up dead. But the way they ended up cutting it, it it actually made Don Castle appear suspect. Like maybe he did this and is getting rid of the body, uh, which is in keeping with how they portrayed him as a very ambiguous, suspicious character, both in that movie and in The Guilty, uh, which were both made around the same time. And which are both available now from Flickr Alley and the Film Noir Foundation on yes. beautiful high-end deluxe combo Blu-ray DVD packages loaded with special features. Thank you. <laughs> See, I'm stealing your job now. I'm stealing your job. I was very happy. I was very happy. Okay. Yeah. I, I knew you were going to do that if I didn't do it, so I thought I'd just save you the trouble. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, all right, your next next question. You want me to do this? Yeah, you do that one. Uh, 18 to 24 months ago, I'm glad somebody can still tell time because it's impossible for me to tell time anymore. So 18 to 24 months ago on this venue, this very venue, 
It was mentioned that the original Jonathan Latimer script of uh, Red Tide, um, Nathan and Martinez is asking this question, and and uh, Nathan, you got that you got that backwards. It wasn't Raymond Chandler's uh, Red Tide. It was Dashiell Hammett's Red Harvest was for sale. Uh, and I, I believe uh, $10,000 was the amount mentioned. I actually think it was 12,000 12, or 12,500 or something. And the question is, do I know what happened to it? Uh, and the answer is no. <laughs> I do not know what happened to it. Uh, I do know, as I may have mentioned back then, that uh, my understanding is that that um, unproduced script is owned by the great Otto Penzler, uh, the dean of American mystery fiction and owner of the Mysterious Bookshop in New York and a collector of all things crime fiction related. And uh, I, that was his script, which he uh, placed on consignment with a wonderful guy named Kevin Johnson, who runs Royal Books which uh, auctions things off uh, that, are, that are on consignment with him, as was uh, Otto's version of that script. Uh, I do not know what happened to it. I did not buy it. So um, I'll try to find out. Uh, I actually sent Otto an email the other day asking him whatever happened to it, and uh, I have not received an answer yet. But we'll, we'll get to the bottom of it. Okay, this lighting is going to get so weird uh, in, in short order, but I'm going to try not to worry about it. Yeah. You look very mysterious, right? Because you always say in the shadows. So. Okay, very good. So I just got like all kinds of blown out right here on my shoulder, but okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Eddie. I've never heard you mention Paramount's Jan Sterling. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my questions are at a weird angle. So I'm going to lean over. Uh, hi, Eddie. I. I Never heard you mention Paramount's Jan Sterling. I always thought that she was in the Audrey Todd or Gloria Graham school. The big Garnival Union Station could be examples. So what do you think of her as an or person, I guess? And also, would you consider the delicious Betty Davis film Beyond the Force Noir? Um, I, I will confess to having uh, shown Beyond the Forest at a film noir festival earlier in my career. Not that that's anything one needs to confess to. Uh, it's not easy to to get it. It's not easy to get a thirty five millimeter print of that of that film. Uh, having said that, I think of that movie as a very noir stained melodrama more than a more than a film noir. And uh, you know, it, it, it's it's entertaining. It's a very entertaining movie. Uh, not not going high on my list of noir films, that's for sure. Uh, as for Jan Sterling, she's just, uh, she was great. Total sweetheart. Uh, we had her a couple of times at uh, the noir festivals in LA. I'm sorry to say that the second time, the first time was wonderful. The second time was part of the hazards of inviting people to do things when they're a little bit um, past the point they should be appearing in public. Uh, Jan was clearly in the early stages of Alzheimer's the second time we did it, and man, it can it can happen fast. And and that was that was not a good experience. Um, it's not you know obviously she got adulation and all that which is nice, but. She wasn't quite on it. The first time, however, was was really great. I, I think it was, I can't remember what film we showed. It was uh, one of these, it wasn't, it wasn't Ace in the Hole, but it was either Union Station or Mystery Street, which she's also in briefly in the very beginning and gives a very, very wonderful performance in that film. Uh, but she was delightful. And a, and a really great guest, and uh, I was quite fond of her. Um, you know, she was married to Paul Stewart, the actor Paul, uh, not Paul Stewart, I'm sorry, Paul Douglas. Um, and, you know, who's, who's one of my faves, because uh, he was a sports writer, sports announcer turned 
movie actor. And it was one of those things like had the same situation when I interviewed Barbara Hale and we talked about her husband, Bill Williams, who had died uh, kind of young and also Paul Douglas uh, died, you know, very young. And um, she, she actually uh, found him, you know, he had a heart attack and died in the bathroom and she found him. And uh, e even decades later, she was completely distraught and, and kind of had a breakdown when we were doing the interview, uh, just talking about her late husband, who she clearly uh, was, was deeply in love with. So that was unfortunate. I may have to move. Is, this is getting too distracting. I thought that this was going to be uh, a no brainer here because it's like I don't need extra light, but <laughs> this is ridiculous. So uh, this is why we love this room because it has this fabulous light, but I realize it's not good for, for shooting here. So maybe what I'll do is just go back a little bit, pull this whole table this way, and then I'm kind of, at least it's, okay, we'll see how we do there. Okay. I don't know. It seems ridiculous to me. It's just going to chase me now. Okay. Oh, poo. I'm doing, a, I'm messing this all up. Okay. So uh, this is, Bob wants to know. Um, he says he saw an interview with film critic A.S. Hamra, who writes for N Plus One, Cineast, and Book Forum, and he said that film noir, here it comes, Anne, film noir isn't a genre, it's a mood. Do you agree with this? Well, Anne, I'm going to let you take that one first. <laughs> I think I've given up on this discussion. <laughs> Is film noir a genre? It's not a genre. Is it a mood? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think maybe maybe a style. It's hard to tell. I mean, I think, you know, it's not like, I don't know. I mean, I kind of think it is a genre in a way. But then it's also a style because you see the style of film noir being used in, in other things. Of you know, course. And, and the thing is, yeah. is, it goes across different genres, right? Because you can have a gangster story that's, really a film noir or you can have like you know something more domestically located and it's a film noir or you can have you know home invasion film could be a film noir a prison film can be a film noir so well yeah. i i hear what you're saying and i have always chosen to answer this by saying are you asking me as a director or as a writer yeah <laughs> Because I'll tell you that if you're looking at it from a stylistic point of view, then uh, yeah, it's a mood. There's a way of shooting it. If you're looking at it from the writer's point of view of it's a particular kind of story, mm -hmm. uh, then I, I'd say, yeah, you, you know, how do you explain the hitchhiker being a, a film noir when it has absolutely no iconography of the standard Film noir. Is this lighting on me kind of noir? I can't tell. Uh, yeah, I think it's noir. <laughs> Let's go with it. It's noir. Yeah, I'm telling you, the light's just going to chase me now. I made a huge mistake sitting here. It's kind of dumb. Anyway, um, but the, the reality is most of the films that we are talking about from the classic era of film noir are crime movies. That's the genre that they're in. They're crime movies. Crime thrillers and murder dramas shot in a particular way that we have come to call film noir. But Westerns can look like that. War movies can look like that. Even some screwball comedies can look like that. Um, so it's, it's neither one or the other. I mean, it just depends on what your perspective is. If you look at it thematically and from a storytelling point of view, there are certain things that are going to be noir. And if you're just looking at it from a stylistic point of view, like how you choose to shoot the movie, then you can shoot it like a film noir, whatever it is. So, so it, it's not an either or proposition. So that that's my answer to that. Okay. Now one more time, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to move here and see if, if I can get, hang on. 
Moving over this way to see if this improves anything. Craziness, craziness now. Okay, this is a whole different view now. You don't see all my booze, but now, oh, now you got Venetian blind shadows and there you go. All this stuff. So, but now all my my microphone and everything is all goofed up. Okay, there we go. Now I'm no oh, look at that now. Oh geez. All right. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can I can I, see I can already budget. see I, would always I know I can already that. see Anne how you're gonna write this one up <laughs> in the synopsis. It's like Eddie tries to find good light and Anne's and starts with two cats, loses one cat, blah blah blah. Now there won't be any tizzy appearances because I'm facing the wrong way, but that that's the way it goes. Okay. But I think this is a less annoying shot now. Okay. okay. You got a question uh, for me? I got a question for you. This is from James. Hey there, longtime fan and first time subscriber. Thank you for subscribing. My question for Eddie involves a tattoo sleeve that I am undertaking at the moment. My tattoo sleeve is a progress in progress is based off classic film noir. I'm curious what iconic stars and imagery Eddie would have for a film noir tattoo sleeve. <laughs> Um, well, as, as, uh, one can see free of tats on the arm. Um, okay. So, but I will make suggestions. Okay. So if you're doing full on sleeves, um, there's the tiz lumbering through the kitchen right now. Uh, if you're doing the full on sleeves, I would say right arm, you have to go with the guys and you've got to have, uh, Mitchum. Robert Mitchum, you have to have Bogart. It has to be Bogart. You need um, John Garfield, Robert Ryan, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say probably Richard Widmark because I see a Tommy Udo tattoo as being kind of definitive in a way. I mean, if you're if you got guts, you got to go with a Tommy Udo tattoo. Uh, so I'm gonna go with those five, and then. On the left arm, I'm going to go with um, Marie Windsor, Jane Greer, Audrey Totter, um, Claire Trevor, and give me give me a last one. Give me Barbara give me Stanwyck. one. Barbara Stanwyck. Barbara Stanwyck and Barbara Stanwyck. Yeah. But see, I was try I was thinking of. I mean, Bogart doesn't count, and and Mitchum doesn't really either, because I was trying to think of performers who are completely synonymous with film noir. You can't think of them in any other way, which is why I was kind of staying away from the Rita Hayworth and the Ava Gardner. And in some respect, even though I consider Stanwyck to kind of be the queen of noir, you know. She could play anything. She could play anything, you know. That's why I like the idea of, you know, you're a hardcore noir fan if you have a tattoo of Marie Windsor. I mean, that's right. that's... That, yeah, there you go. So there you, there you are. I hope we see if you actually get these tattoos, uh, James. We want you to send send in a photo, so we can uh, show it of your noir sleeves. I uh, I applaud your commitment. Absolutely. You know my my buddy Jeff Mantor, who who uh, has the Larry Edmonds Bookstore in Hollywood. Uh, he has. Uh, a beautiful Rita Hayworth as Gilda tattoo, uh, full color on one arm. He has Ava Gardner in The Killers, uh, the iconic shot of her sitting on the table uh, on the other arm. So he's he's already made the commitment to those two. So I I was thinking outside of of Jeff there because I don't I don't James I don't want you to be sporting the same tattoos that Jeff has. That would be no good. So. All right, um, Michael, this is our buddy Michael in Post Falls, Idaho. I, I, I feel like I know Michael because he sends in so many questions. There, is there gonna be some kind of action? That, yep, they're back, they're both back. Charlotte and Emily are both in formation now. Uh, but in all the time that Michael has watched us, he, he does not recall us ever bringing up one of the masters of crime fiction, Elmore Leonard. Yeah. 
so he's saying maybe this is because the films made from his books tend to not fit neatly into the classification of noir. Uh, still, he assumes we've read him and uh, he wants to know which are our favorite Elmore Leonard books. His is 52 Pickup. And what is the best movie adaptation of his work? Michael's putting in a vote for Life of Crime which is based on the novel Switch, which I know that must be the second version of Switch because I know that, uh, I, I mean, Switch of Stick because uh, I think Burt Reynolds made one back in the day. Yeah, Burt Reynolds um, did Stick. Pardon? Yeah, Burt Reynolds, there is, a, there is that was yeah. the first thing. But, but uh, anyway, uh, here's my thing about Elmore Leonard is he, he is, one of the greatest, uh, but he is a two genre writer. I mean, he has written as many great Westerns as he has crime novels. So I, I tend to just think of him as a Jack of all genres, uh, you know, and like you could pick, pick five great Westerns. I mean, off the top of my head, I, I, I'm thinking of, um, the tall T, which I think was the first thing ever adapted first movie ever adapted from an Elmore Leonard novel, which is a great Bud Bedecker film. He also did um, uh, Ombre with Paul Newman is a good one. 310 to Yuma, of course. That's been made twice. The, the Delmer Daves one is particularly great with Van Heflin and Glenn Ford. Um, he did Valdez is Coming, uh, the Burt Lancaster picture that is really, really good. Um, and, and I know there's another really great Western I'm, I'm forgetting in there. And, and then there are the, after he did all the Westerns, then he did crime and yeah, 52 pickup is pretty great. Um, uh, one that is often overlooked that I think is a fantastic movie is directed by Richard Fleischer is Mr. Majestic with Charles Bronson which is a, uh, could be shown as part of, last time we talked about the trucking noir, right? Thieves Highway and Black Gravel. Mr. Majestic is kind of in that, in that group. It's like Agra noir. <laughs> the guy just wants to get his melons into market, you know, and all, the, all these shady people and crooks are trying to keep him from his mission. And uh, that's a really good movie. And then, of course, there's all the stuff that everybody knows now, which is, uh, you know, Get Shorty and um, Out of Sight, which are both terrific, um, and 52 Pickup, which we already pointed out. And, and of course, there's his biggest hit of all, which I've never seen, which is uh, the TV series Justified, which, which I have never watched. Now, do you have any um, – th that's like my – off the top, Elmore Leonard, and anything in there that strikes your fancy in? Um, I just wanted to say with 310 to Yuma, that is the only time that I thought Glenn Ford was sexy. Like I've never understood him as a leading man because I've always found him really bland, but he is very, very sexy in that movie. So I was like, finally, finally. He's I playing see the that. bad guy. He's the bad guy. That's probably why that might say something <laughs> about me. <laughs> no. Um, but I did just watch a couple months ago, there's a recent adaptation of one of his books and it's with Jennifer An Aniston and she gets like kidnapped by um, like these, these it's two characters that actually are also in um, Rum Punch. It's like they were in- Oh, that's the one, that's obviously the other one I forgot is Jackie Brown, yeah, which, so which Jackie is based Brown, on Rum Punch. Yeah, Which is, yeah, great. But then those two, two of those characters were in a, an earlier novel, and they recently made a movie of that with Jennifer Aniston. Um, Is that the one that he's talking about, Life of Crime? I think that might be it, yeah. I'm trying because I'm just so – it's been a while since I've seen it, but that may be what he's talking about, Life of Crime. It is good. I really uh, liked it uh, I, I, I'll, I'll check it out. Uh, the – there are also – I'll, I'll mention two outliers – that nobody ever talks about. Um, one is uh, Touch by Paul Schrader, 
which is an adaptation of an Elmore Leonard book uh, with Skeet Ulrich and uh, and oh, okay. several other good actors in the film, which which was not well reviewed and kind of fell between the cracks. Schrader's made a few of those in his time that just kind of come and go and nobody paid attention, but it's actually a pretty interesting movie. And there's also one called Kill Shot uh, with Mickey Rourke and uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and the great Diane Lane and my buddy Thomas Jane is in it as well. And, um, you know, that it's not a bad movie. It's really weird. You know, John Madden is the director and he had done Shakespeare in Love and like was at the top end and like, you know, was th that film, correct me if I'm wrong, did that film not win a Best Picture Oscar, Shakespeare in Love? I, not that I keep track of these things, but. I not remember. But this is what he did as his follow up and the film just kind of tanked. I mean, it was before the Mickey Rourke comeback with the wrestler. And he, he plays this really wild hitman that is not too unlike the character that uh, Javier Bardem plays in No Country for Old Men, only he's kind of Native American. And, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt is his protege. And it's just weird. I'm not saying it's a great movie, but you know, a lot of these genre films, they don't have to be the best movie ever made. If you're into this stuff, you kind of dig it. And uh, that was pretty good. So th there you go. There, there are two more little known Elmore Leonard's that I'm throwing. And there was also, was it, uh, oh gosh, the one with George Clooney. Well, that's out of sight. Out of sight, yeah. That, you yeah, with Gen outside. Jennifer okay. Lopez, Lopez and George, yeah, yeah uh, fantastic. Fantastic I, I, film. Even though I thought, uh, I can't remember the name of his actor, something Guzman, who was approaching the, the woman who had been the wife of the magician. He was like so, he's like this hardened criminal who was so fascinated by magic. Uh, yeah, is that conversation? Um, yes, I know, I know kept, that actor. He Catherine did. Keener is the woman. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I, I like that. I like that movie a lot. Ving mm -hmm. Rames and. It, it, that was good stuff. Um, okay, you're you're going now. Okay. Da, da, da. And this is from John, trying to find the 1941 film Among the Living with Francis Farmer and Albert Decker. Is it as noir as the, the lives of its two stars? <laughs> well, it's a movie. It's a movie, John. <laughs> so no, it's not as noir as the lives and demises of those two actors. Uh, but uh, the good news for you, John, is you can find Among the Living now because Kino Lorber put it out as a Blu-ray. It was for years and years kind of a, a lost film, but it's you know, my, my, my buddy Bob O'Neill, who used to be in charge of the archive at Universal, um, said one time, somebody announced, you know, return of the lost film. And Bob said, lost? Nobody asked for it. <laughs> and that's kind of what happened with Among the Living. It wasn't really lost. There was a really good 35 millimeter print of it that I, I showed yeah. quite a few times actually over the years. And uh, I'm very much hoping to show it on TCM uh, on Noir Alley next year, probably. And uh, it it's really an interesting film, uh, you know. It, it's like a Southern Gothic noir, weird, creepy thing. Albert Decker plays a, a dual role and it has young Susan Hayward. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, holy God, she is, incredible in that movie uh yeah a very strange movie and it's only like 61 minutes long and they pack a lot into those 61 minutes so uh john i hope you uh this helps and that you can order it as you're watching us you can order that thing online and have it tomorrow good luck <laughs> <laughs> all right now alfred in santa clara california wants to know if uh, we are familiar with the novel Wisteria Cottage and the film that it, it uh, 
it's based the film based on it uh which is called edge of fury made in 1958. um have you are you familiar with this ann uh it's a really weird i do not know the movie i mean i uh, what is up with me today i haven't even had a drink yet i mean i'm looking at the bar over <laughs> here and i haven't even had a drink and i'm jumbling everything up uh i have not read the novel but i do know the movie uh which is very odd it's a very strange super low budget very unsettling and kind of disturbing film you know the, you know those low budget movies that you know are totally fake because they have no money and the acting is really kind of bad but somehow that makes it even creepier and weirder mm -hmm. that's that's kind of like what edge of fury is about uh, about a guy who moves into a house with these two women and he, and he wants to paint but there's something clearly wrong with this guy and and it gets kind of ugly i i'm trying to remember the there's a writer and director who I don't believe did anything else. I think his name was Daniel Gurney, if memory serves. And I believe that when he got in a little over his head, that Irving Lerner, who uh, at that time was making Murder by Contract and City of Fear, Irving Lerner came in and, and helped him through to the end of the production. Let's just let's just put it that way. That that is my understanding. Um, and, and it's an interesting film. I think you can find it uh, online. You know, I, I don't everybody who watches this knows I don't advocate going and watching stuff that has been pirated online. But um, that is a film that's kind of hard to find otherwise. So if you're really curious, that's that's how you can see it. You've, you've intrigued me from your description. Yeah, and, and you know, it's one of those things that's great. It's like, if, if you don't like it, it's it's over pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is nice. As opposed to not liking something that's two and a half hours long. And, no. so, wait, wait, so I'm going to ask, and if, if a movie is a stinker and it's two hours or longer, will you give up on it or will you always watch till the bitter end? I typically will, will like, I'll, I usually watch something to the bitter end. Like I was watching, um, I think I talked about this. I think it's called The Vortex. No, it's not Vortex, but the film, this film that uh, the French guy Noe did. Oh, Gaspar Noe, yeah. Yeah, and so I thought, oh, great. I finally found something of his to watch. And it was just like, um, there was like a kernel of a really great film in there. <laughs> and and like the premise was so like intriguing, especially this relationship between this brother and sister whose parents had been killed. And then that they, sounds like into started. the void. Yeah, into the void. And it was just yeah. like, I don't know. I think part of that too, though, is just when they're showing like the drug world and stuff. It's like, you know, I live in a neighborhood that where this has a serious drug problem. It is not that glamorous. Well, I didn't. I didn't really think there was. I didn't find too much glamorous about enter enter the void. That's what it was. Yeah. Enter the void. Yeah. Uh, but I do. I like his films very much yeah. because nobody make nobody makes films like Gaspar Noe. Yeah. I mean, he's he is a very crazy, uh, provocative filmmaker to, to me in a very good way. And if people are repulsed by the movies and it turns them off, I totally get that. And like, why would anybody who's sensitive want to subject themselves to irreversible or I stand alone or films yeah. like that? But um, I, I find them pretty incredible movies, you know? Yeah. And, I mean, so. with this film, I just felt like there, there felt like there are things in there that just, like we're just like I don't need to see a woman having an abortion you know what I mean and I thought that was like and to me it was very distracting from the story because I was so intrigued by the brother and sister's relationship and to me I just was much more interested in that than a lot of the other stuff that was going around and you know I kind of knew from the beginning how it was going to end which was also kind of like you know 
but that was the thing to me was I thought that part of the story was so compelling and I really wanted more time on that because that to me what was really interesting yeah and, I haven't and seen uh it, I, I haven't seen a climax yeah. which is the one with, with the like the troop of actors and performers who all take drugs and go oh yeah, yeah it's supposed to be really good I, I, ha I haven't <laughs> seen that one yet but yeah. uh and and apparently his new film is is exceptional. The one I with really uh, Dario see, Argento and yeah, Vortex. I really, really wanted to see. I really want to see that actually. Yeah, I, I'm, that I'm, just sounds fantastic. I really want to watch that one. I I have a soft spot for filmmakers whose work you have to get psyched up for. Like mm -hmm. you've got to brace yourself for it, and uh, and he is definitely that. Yeah. You know, like you don't you don't want to watch this if you're not in a good place, and you don't want to watch it if you're in a good place. So yeah, yeah. so you have to find that sweet spot where it's like I can I can deal with this right now. Yeah, and like I said, I mean, there's just films of his that I just don't want to watch because I really don't like to watch. Even though I love horror films, I know it sounds weird. There are certain subject matters with violence that I don't I don't like to watch. Well, so have you stayed away from Irreversible? Yeah. Yeah, because because Irreversible was the first film of that was his first movie, I think. Yeah. And that damn thing totally took me by surprise. I mean, the beginning of that film is uh, you literally have not seen anything like that. Yeah. And the violence is so stunning, literally, because it's like I I'm not going to describe it, but, you know, so there, it's it's incredibly unsettling violence, and then a, you know a, a rape scene that is the most excruciating thing maybe ever put on screen. So yeah, run out and see it. It's great. Bring the kids. <laughs> Saturday matinee. Anyway, but having said that, I'm glad the guy's making movies, and I think I'll I'll continue watching them as long as I can do it at the right time. Yeah. Uh, where are we? Uh, I, I think it's number it. nine. There we go. I recently saw the 2021 German film Hinterland at the Seattle International Film Festival. It immediately struck me as a neo-noir that Eddie would appreciate. Have you seen it? And that's Jeff from Seattle. Um. No, I have not seen it. I, I I have seen a coming attraction for it, and it looks very intriguing. Uh, it looks very um, what's the word? Uh, it, it's very art directed, and it looks very um, fanciful and dark and very intriguing. So. I will definitely watch it and report back. Oh, I'm st hold on, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to I'm going to move one more time because now I'm just basically in the dark. So hang on. Jesus, this was a bad idea. This was a bad idea. Okay, now. Now here you can see the outside of my house and yes. now things look a little better, I think. Yeah. So we all got three, somebody, I remember once somebody said, can you walk around and show you more of your house? And it's like, well, that wasn't the plan today, but that's what you're getting. Okay. Nice lamp. That's my Puss in Boots lamp right there. I really love it. <laughs> we can turn it on if you want a little more effect here, you know, hold on. There you go. There's, there's there you the go. Lamp. Oh, there. Yeah, that just works beautifully. Okay. Okay. Now, um, I take it you haven't seen Hinterland either. I have not seen Hinterland. Okay. But it does look good. So thank you, uh, Jeff, for the recommendation. Um, now, uh, Cliff in Sacramento, who asked when I'm coming back to present films at the Tower, don't know. Uh, he wants Cliff wants to know which heist films produced in the United States during the 40s and 50s do you consider to be the best to be great film noir 
And what makes each of these special? Can you recommend five of these? Well, Cliff, you need to you need to read Dark City, the Lost World of Film Noir, specifically the chapter Knockover Square, where the writer um, talks all about heist films as as film noir. Uh, so I'm just going to ramble off the off the top of my head. I'm going to say. Uh, Criss Cross, which is a heist film, even though it's really a tale of amour fou. Uh, Criss Cross, The Asphalt Jungle, Kansas City Confidential, The Killing, um, and, and we'll throw one other one. In. Well, I, I, I'm going to uh, I'm going to say he says produced in the U.S. It's in English. But it's not produced in the U.S. It's the League of Gentlemen. Uh, Basil Dearden's film, I think he made it in 1955 or 56 in England, is is a pretty cool heist movie too. Of course, uh, the, I, my number one favorite of all time is Rafifi. Of course, uh, you know, which is made by an American director, but it's in French. But under no circumstances is any anybody who is trying to pull uh, their noir credentials who doesn't watch Rafifi because it's in French loses all their credibility instantaneously because Rafifi is just the best heist movie of all time. Yeah, it's incredible. And, uh, you know, yeah, that, and that's it. Not in the classic period, but um, and I don't know, I guess it is a heist film, well, Circle Rouge, which is just one of my all-time favorite films. So I, I feel compelled yet again to tell people to watch it. Yeah, I, I, I will second that. I mean, there's a bunch of Jean-Pierre Melville films, you know, uh, that, that qualify. And, and then, you know, years ago I did, uh, you know, the Heist Festival, which was really fun because the, the the truth is that heist movies were not really a thing until the asphalt jungle. The asphalt jungle kind of set the whole thing up. Yeah. And and then there were all kinds of different types of heist films, you know, um, all, all over the world. I, I you know, and, and I loved doing that uh, festival where we showed them you know, from uh, Four Ways Out, the Guillermo Petri film that uh, was made in Italy with a script by uh, Fellini. And, you know, just all, there's a lot of Japanese heist movies, Cruel Gun Story. And uh, anyway, so th there's there's a lot of them, but I'm going to stick with what Cliff said. He wanted produced in the U.S. So uh, that, that's what I'm going with. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> really quick, cause was Violent Saturday one of the ones we showed during the heist themed one, or was that? Uh, I, I think no. I think it. I think it was. I think yeah. Violent Saturday was part of that. Which is I love which that is. Movie. Yeah, I mean it's it's the you know it was directed by Richard Fleischer, but I call it the Douglas Sirk heist movie. Yeah. Because, because it feels just like a Douglas Sirk movie, right? Yeah, no, uh, I walked out of that film and I said, I, I never thought these would words come out of my mouth. Richard Egan was amazing. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty he's pretty good in that movie. It's a great performance, you know, and I just, you know, he's like not someone who's particularly impressed me before, but God, he, that was that was his film. He was fantastic in that. Yeah, there's a there's a lot going on in that movie, and it is it is very enjoyable. Victor Mature is good in it too, and Sylvia yes, Sidney. Sylvia oh, Sidney has great. that that great little supporting role, and and now that I mentioned her, I, I will just have to tell the quick story about um, that's how Fleischer got the title for his autobiography. Just tell me when to cry was from Sylvia Sidney because um, you know Fleischer was still pretty young when he was making that film. And he was kind of in awe of working with Sylvia Sidney, who'd been making pictures since the beginning, you know. And he went into her her trailer on, on location to talk through the motivations of the character yeah. and all this stuff. And she looks at him and she goes, Richard, 
just tell me when to cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty glad. And Lee Marvin, of course, is fantastic in Violent wow. Saturday. He, he is. He really kind of. He kind of steals the movie, honestly. He does. It's just such a weird, and the whole relationship with him and the, and the guy he's doing the heist with, and just their interactions and stuff. Just it's really funny. I don't know. He's great in that. Yeah, J. Carroll Nash and and uh, Fleischer told me that Marvin improvised the whole scene in the hotel room the night before the robbery. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, that he just said, I, I've got this thing I've been thinking about, like, who, who is this guy and blah, blah, blah. He goes, J just let me let me run with this, you know, and he, he gave him his five minutes, you know, and Marvin just improvised this whole thing about his ex-wife and all this stuff. And it was it was maybe the five best minutes in the movie. Yeah, honestly. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. Yeah. OK um let's see where did you say pray uh eddie why are modern recreation recreations of the film noir period always so unconvincing lots of photographers online have tutorials and so-called film noir portraits and aside from lots of venetian blind lighting they just never look convincing is it hand retouching versus photoshop is it the modern lighting equipment or just a poor choice of models and that's from Liz. <laughs> uh, what a sweeping condemnation Oh, okay, Liz. Uh, I guess it's kind of all of the above uh, in a way, but I also see many, many good. Uh, I, I don't know what to call them. I mean, I think that the, the problem when you see people trying to imitate the noir style, especially in still photographs and things, it, it's because they're shoehorning too much in to try to make it look like film noir and it has a staginess and a, and a there's a phoniness about it. Um, it's interesting because this is coming on the heels of last week are talking about um, making the noir city posters. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's interesting to note that very early on when we shot those posters, it was a conscious decision on our part not to do them in black and white. For, for this, partly for this very reason, because it, it seemed like a lot of people who don't know what it, what it takes to do that, look at it in black and white and immediately dismiss it as an imitation or pastiche or something because it's in black and white. Um, whereas if you just shoot it in color, but you use the same kind of angles and the same kind of lighting, and you don't try too hard to emulate the original period look, uh, then you can kind of get away with it as its own thing, which, which is what I think we've done with the posters, you know, and because our inspiration for the posters is as much uh, pulp magazine covers and and uh, comic book stuff and movie posters as much as it's film noir itself. So we're we're paying homage to something else. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's the people, it's the models who don't have their it looks like a student film because they're just too young. They're not, they're not the lived in characters that you see in film noir. And that's part of the reason uh, why it doesn't work, which is, is probably more true of, of men being photographed for noir than women. Uh, I think the, the women can do that femme fatale thing a little better than the guys can do the tough guy thing. <laughs> so, um, that's it. And I mean, obviously, uh, when Liz points out the difference in the photography, I mean, they were shooting with totally different cameras and, and everything. But the principles of the lighting are the same. I mean, the John Alton's principles of lighting apply whether you're shooting with a Mitchell camera in 1948 or whether you're shooting with an iPhone 
Today, the lighting principles remain the same. John Alton would come back from the grave and kick my ass for the lighting on this segment right here. Yes, he would. I mean, he would he just would. like, he would be infuriated. Like, what do you think you're doing? I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, but right now it looks okay. So I'm just trying to hold this position just and not move. move too much. I'm trying to not move. <laughs> I've definitely seen a lot of nice cityscape nor inspired photos that I've liked a lot. They get, they just pop up on Twitter a lot and so I guess cityscapes, it's kind of easier because you don't have, have the models and stuff. But I've seen some really nice, like right. more style photography of, of cities that I've liked very much. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Okay, last, uh, the last official question here is from uh, Sean in Apex, North Carolina. Uh, Sean says he's seen the first three film versions of the Maltese Falcon. That's very good. That's the original. 31 version, the Maltese Falcon and Satan Met a Lady, the one with uh, Betty Davis, and then the, the great one with Bogart that we all know. Uh, and he has read the book several times. Uh, he has often fantasized that after the conclusion of the film, it's revealed that Effie, Spade Secretary, actually swapped out the real Falcon for the one given to Gutman. Well, and then whether she and Spade run off together with the bird or Effie acted on her own, either way, it is fun to speculate. They had so much trouble finding one, though, Sean. How would they find a duplicate? <laughs> so, I, I mean, that was a hell of a lot of trouble to find the one. Um, it's fun to speculate. So he asks, are there any film noir, films noir, he actually spells it properly, would you have imagined where you have imagined what happens beyond the film's ending an added resolution or a twist interesting question and have you ever uh, uh like imagined what happens after the fade out um i would love to see someone write like a follow-up to the maltese falcon set during the second world war where sam is away fighting in the war and after takes over the agency and becomes a private detective and we get to see a story of Effie solving a crime. I would love to see that. <laughs> to have, you know what I mean? That she kind of takes over yeah. Yeah, the yeah, reins yeah. and stuff as women did in wartime, you know, and it's, I think that would be really cool. Uh, interesting. And, and, you know, there was a prequel to the Maltese Falcon yeah. that, that Joe Gores wrote, the Spade and Archer book. But here's the thing. Um, letting the cat out of the bag. This is actually an idea that I've carried around for a number of years um, and have actually already collected a few stories in this regard, but I haven't gotten my act together to actually follow through on this, which is a collection of short stories based on this very thing. Like certain characters in noir, what happened to them and so you get the rest of the story, yeah. right? Uh, and this may still happen at some point, right? Uh, I certainly know enough really talented writers uh, who all would want to take a crack at this. Uh, you know, I'm embarrassed to say, but the first person who contributed to this was Barry Gifford, who gave me a story about uh tommy woodry the little the kid in the window Ooh. like what what happened to tommy woodry when he grew up right now i'm embarrassed that i'm holding that story hostage and i haven't uh gotten you know 20 other stories to go around it uh i i was going to write one about what happened to dixon Steele after in a lonely place the movie right? or the the movie not the book the the movie no. this this was all the movies not not all, all movies okay all, all of this would be the movie characters not necessarily the characters from the books right um although i do have in some cases i have a little issue with where um like i wouldn't want to see oh never mind i'm not going to go there i'm i'm okay. already giving away too much information but that that's a book that i really want to do at some point and and 
uh, I would probably publish that through my own uh, Blackpool publications um, as, as a fundraiser thing for the Film Noir Foundation. It, it would be it would be great fun. So, Sean, your idea is so good. I thought of it already. <laughs> <laughs> And and I and I remember I'm gonna. It's called Desperate Characters, which to, kind of sums up film noir, right? Yeah. Pretty pretty good. Um, anyway, so our, our I want to bring up one other question okay. uh, to our esteemed viewers because this one didn't make it in this week because as as people may or may not know. Uh, they submit all these questions to ask Eddie, but then Anne very kindly goes through and sifts through them and arranges them and sends them to me just shortly before we do this. Uh, but, a, but a question came across Ask Eddie that I was very intrigued by and tried to find an answer to for this person. Uh, and I don't have the question in front of me, and I'm embarrassed to say that I will not be able to call this person by name, but they, they wrote, and, and it's intriguing to me because I get this a lot these days. It's people trying to remember a movie they saw when they were a child. And what, in, what I find so amusing about the way they ask these questions is that they recreate the entire situation in which they saw the film. Yeah as though that's going to help me remember <laughs> what well, I'm not, I'm not being critical because I know that this is an important thing is it, I, I have my own versions of this story. Like I was in this place, I saw it, I was with these people. This was the weather that day. It was raining. My mother took us to see blah, blah, blah. I was traumatized and now I can't remember what the film was, you know. Anyway, this person uh, described a film in which a woman is caring for a small child. She puts the child to bed in a crib or something and tosses a cigarette that she's smoking, flicks it and it falls on the floor, not the ashtray. And then the, the baby's room catches on fire and she runs in and rescues the baby, but then she's covered in bandages and later there's a big reveal and she's horribly scarred uh, in this fire. And this, this, I think it was a guy, uh, said that this movie totally traumatized him as a kid and that he would couldn't go to bed because he would look on the floor for discarded cigarettes, even though nobody in his house smoked. And then years and years later, he told his sister that he had these nightmares and he was traumatized. And she said, so was I. They never talked about it. They saw the movie at the same time together and they were both traumatized. But uh, he wants to know what this movie is. And I do not know. I've asked, I even asked some other film expert friends of mine who are usually infallible on these things. And the only thing all of us could come up with was the film Face of Fire, uh, which starred um, James Whitmore and, and was actually uh, based on a great Stephen Crane short story called The Monster, which was about a, a black um, servant who rescues a doctor's young son from a fire in the doctor's laboratory. And he's burned to, you know, beyond recognition to where he becomes ostracized in the community even more than he was as a black man. And uh, he, even though he's a hero, the community can't accept him because of the, the damage to him. Yeah. Um, of course, in the movie version, James Whitmore plays the part. So they completely take the, the element out that he's an African-American guy, which, you know, they did that in the setup and all, 
you know, various other things. But that that's the only film that we could think of where there was a rescue of a child in a fire and then the person is all bandaged and then when the bandages come off, he's hideously scarred. But this person seemed to, to think, oh no, it, it was definitely a woman yeah. who, who to whom this happened. So I bring this up because I'm wondering if people watching this have any clues as to what yeah. what this film might be. Yeah. So yeah, let us know if you know what the film is. You can, um, you know, I mean, you can comment down below on, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Throw it in the comments. You know? Yeah, and and yeah. we'll we'll look for it. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I was baffled by that. Okay, so yeah. lastly, even though the lighting is ridiculous now, very very noir lighting now. Yeah. But actually, I was thinking Marlon Brando and Apocalypse Now because <laughs> you're wearing the round neck shirt. <laughs> Okay, that was my Marlon Brando and Apocalypse Now imitation. I need I need to like squeeze out a thing on my head and let it run down, you know. Okay, I want to just last week, and you got the um, the Dan Duryea Award. I did, uh, which I have yet to bestow upon you personally. But I also wanted to just um, I get so behind because I have so many things I am doing. Uh, that I, I don't respond to people uh, in proper time when they are kind and, and send me wonderful things. So I want to just do that right now sure. by pointing out that uh, a lovely guy named Jonathan Wander uh, wrote me a lovely note uh, specifically relating to how much he enjoys these programs that we do. So I assume Jonathan will be watching. And he was kind enough to send me a copy of the American Thesaurus of Slang. Nice. Which is fan, which I did not have. I have a dictionary of slang and, of course, the all-time classic uh, dictionary of underworld lingo. Uh, but this is now added to my collection, and uh, I, I really thank Jonathan very much for that. It was not inexpensive to send that very heavy book to me, so I thank you. Also, after watching Ask Eddie, uh, Kevin Avery sent me this fabulous book called It's All One Case, which is the archives of Ross McDonald and his, the whole history of his tremendous creation of Lou Archer, private detective. That was two or two or three episodes ago. I think we talked about um, yeah. about why isn't Ross McDonald as as you know aren't people don't fall over him like they do Hammett and Chandler. Uh, this is a fabulous book and a total labor of love uh, by Paul Nelson and Kevin Avery. I don't know, Anne, if you're old enough to remember Paul Nelson, who was a, one of the original writers for Rolling Stone magazine. He was a great uh, rock critic, I know, which a lot of people think is an oxymoron, but uh, Paul Nelson was a really, I remember reading his stuff back in the day. I did not realize that he was such a huge Ross McDonald fan. And he spent many, many days with Ross McDonald, Kenneth Miller by real name, uh, doing these interviews that make up the, the bulk of this book, which is absolutely fascinating. So I really appreciate that. Uh, I also, I don't, I don't think he, he actually watches Ask Eddie. I know he watches TCM, but I got a kick out of this because I got a, I got a very nice note and a book from uh, country singer Marty Stewart, who sent me this, uh, oh, there you go, this book of American ballads, which is really interesting because it's a book of photography by Marty Stewart. Wow. And, uh, and the pictures are great. They're absolutely fantastic. I have a candid photographs so of, here, here you go. Just open randomly to this page. This is good. The Jerry Lee Lewis photo, <laughs> this page, and then a great shot here of, I guess he's got John, Johnny Cash, 
uh, and Ray Charles. And, okay, cool. John John Alton's hating me for this lighting because you can't really see it. Anyway, that was very that, that, nice. That book just made me think how much my dad would have loved that book. I that would have I would have given him a copy of that. Yeah, and, uh, and that. Uh, Marty is a is a pretty cool guy. He came to the TCM festival and introduced High Noon and and sang the theme song to high noon for the audience and uh it was a complete surprise that he uh he sent this book along after that See, that, was, then, that was tex ritter right that wrote the song for, yeah, yeah yeah and uh and then lastly i just uh this was more of a not a thank you gift or anything this was more of a pro thing they this this was sent uh along in the hopes that there would be a review of this in the Noir City magazine, which there will be by me. Uh, but it's this new book that's just coming out that's pretty awesome called Hulk, Ooh, Hulk The Shadow Power. is on the cover. The Shadow is on the cover. It's, it's actually a very um, interesting book that documents the history of the Shadow and Doc Savage Ooh. through all of their incarnations and with many, many great reproductions of the pulp magazine covers, the the posters, the paperback book covers, all that stuff from the from the thirties up through the seventies and eighties. Uh, but what makes it uh, uh, applicable, I think, to noir, uh, the noir that we talk about, is um, the book was clearly done because um, the author Neil McGinnis is suggesting quite rightly that um, the shadow and doc savage are are the precursors to batman and superman yeah. and and then sort of kick-started the whole superhero thing mm -hmm. uh, that would then turn into comic books and, and eventually lead yeah. to what we now have as the marvel and dc universe and all yeah. that stuff and uh, but the book is really fantastic, and it, it I'm so happy it contained a big chapter on uh, on my idol Jim Steranko, and all the great um, covers he did for the Shadow paperbacks. Uh, I guess that was like the late '70s, '80s, or something. But uh, a lot of these things, like I was saying, turn up in the posters that we do. And just our whole design approach, both at the for the festivals and the magazine and everything, very much inspired by these uh, publications and and just the the dynamic artwork and everything. So uh, I th I thank everybody for sending those those things along. That was a real treat. And North City Chicago is coming. North City Chicago is coming. I think we have a lockdown on the lineup on the film lineup uh i i just rather than just blurt it out here i i really suggest that when you, you know we'll let you know and as soon as everything is is completely finalized and then you can post it on social media and we'll we'll do all that but i do know that the the film lineups for chicago and detroit have both been uh, pretty much finalized. These days I've learned to wait and, and yeah. until I see the absolute confirmation, I'm not saying uh, what it is because they sometimes you get the rug pulled out from under you. Yeah, or Italians send films to you and you find them on your front porch at the last minute. <laughs> that, was, that was that heist movie I was talking about that Fellini wrote, yeah. Oh. It's like you can't get the movie. No, the movie isn't going to arrive. And then I walk out and I fall over it on my front porch. <laughs> like, how did they get my address? This was supposed to go to the theater. Yeah, that was a weird one. Um, and that was a good movie too. Yeah, I love that movie. That I hope really I cool. hope that comes out on Blu-ray at some point. Anyway, this this lighting, I do. I see. <laughs> I see what you're saying. In the dark. I'm almost completely in the dark. <laughs> I, this was a really bad idea. I promise I won't be back in my kitchen next time we do this. 
But you're you're absolutely right. Your your call was spot on with the Brando in uh, Apocalypse Now. Oh, yeah. You know, I could see. Especially since she just got your hair all almost completely. Well, I have to really look like it in the shirt. I have to shave my head completely if I wanted to go full on really Brando, do. full yeah. on, full on Kurtz. Yeah, no, well, I I don't want to. I don't want to do this show with you if you're going to actually be like Brando on a set. So <laughs> don't worry about that. Life's too damn short. Don't worry about that. <laughs> you know, that means that means you'll have to be Martin Sheen, and you know what that, that means. Heart attack. That's, that's that's no good. Yeah. And the heart attack come come out of the muck. You don't have to raise up out of the muck. You know. Yeah. Anyway. Not big on the shed eating the cow. No, no good. When he dies, it dies, man. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're we're now off into that's a war movie. That's not a film. No, we're, we're off topic here. So, um, if you like what we do, you can always donate to the Film Noir Foundation at filmnoirfoundation.org. Org, and if you donate twenty dollars or more and sign up on our email list then you do get the digital version of north city magazine sent to you um kind of quarterly and kind of <laughs> mostly quarterly yeah so i just wanted to say that and the money Which goes people to should... us restoring films like high tide absolutely and the guilty and uh, yeah. many other things and and do that soon because the next issue of the magazine which is underway now uh being laid out by michael cronenberg uh vince keenan the editor just declared best issue yet All right and and i have i mean i i say that but i honestly kind of always mean it and and this one really is pretty extraordinary there's there's just so much good stuff in it we actually have a uh pretty extensive interview with john Dahl, who uh we are you know he's this year's modern noir master so um you know red rock west the last seduction all that stuff so um great interview with with john Dahl. uh there's a bunch of stuff in there we actually got an interview with uh meg gardner and michael mann pops in oh, wow. for, a, for a little bit about heat two the, the novel that is coming out uh, based on the original Michael Mann movie. And then there's just all, there's all, all kinds of just really incredible articles in this issue. So uh, it, it's a goodie. It's a goodie. And the North City Annual will be coming out in September. Yep. So that, that's very cool too. Um, so if you're watching on YouTube, if you can like and subscribe and share the video, I would be very grateful. Likewise, and I promise I will never again do this in my kitchen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for bearing with us. You know, uh, it, it, it's weird. It, we couldn't have more different lighting between the two of us. It's I know, just, it's it, insane. It's incredible. You got yeah. that warm sepia tone, and I'm more, yeah. Well, oh, well. you know, you are you have even lighting. I, have I do have even lighting. I have completely uneven lighting, which might look dramatic at some points, but it's really kind of exasperating and <laughs> frustrating. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, On that note, the lighting will be better next time. We should be back in two weeks. My goal is for us to be on every two weeks. Also for people, so they know if they send in questions, um, we're about six weeks behind because um, I've been definitely ill twice this, this year. <laughs> So knock on wood that <laughs> that trend has stopped. Yeah, let's let's stay healthy. Stay healthy, and I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm wearing my mask on Muni, so I think that's very all good. I can do. Very good. That's that's important. That is important. Okay. So uh, good night. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye.